und wir sind live. Hallo lieber Zuschauer, du bist hier genau richtig beim Cryptopia Coin Summit und heute haben wir einen ganz besonderen Gast und zwar Max Kordek. Max Kordek ist Founder und CEO von Lisk und die Leute, die jetzt ein bisschen länger im Crypto Game drin sind, die kennen Lisk natürlich. Für die, die jetzt erst neu eingestiegen sind, nochmal so als, als kurze Recap, Lisk ist eigentlich ähm, ja, eine der wenigen Urgesteine, vor allem eine der wenigen deutschen Urgesteine, die bis heute noch stehen, die sich bis heute weiterentwickelt haben und Jetzt wird euch Max etwas über die, ja, ich sag mal, nächste Entwicklungsstufe von Lisk erzählen und über Interoperability ähm, im Detail berichten. Das heißt, du bekommst hier eins zu eins Insiderwissen von ähm, ja, einem der bekanntesten Leute auf dem Gebiet. Deswegen nutze die Chance, schreib auf jeden Fall mit und ganz, ganz wichtig, schreib deine Fragen in den Chat. Die beantworten wir dann im Anschluss an die äh, Präsentation. Genau. Und ja, schreibt vielleicht mal in den Chat, ob ihr uns gut hören und gut sehen könnt. Ich ja. denke aber, das dazu auch guten Morgen von meiner Seite. Sagt gerne Bescheid, ob ihr mich sehen könnt und ob ihr mich hören könnt. Wäre sehr hilfreich. Genau, aber ich, ich glaube, so wie die Technik ist, ah, perfekt, eins, ja, Fiat Manita schreibt eins, perfekt. Schön, dass du wieder da bist, Fiat Manita. Ah, Aurix ist auch wieder da. Cool, dann ähm, würde ich sagen, wir können losstarten. Jetzt ganz kurz für Leute, die jetzt neu beim Kultopia Coins Summit sind, Geht auf Cryptopia.cash, tragt euch da auf den Button die Mailingliste ein, ist kostenlos, dann bekommt ihr bei jedem Workshop ja eine Nachricht, ihr bekommt Aufzeichnungen und Handouts. Gut, dann würde ich sagen, übergebe ich an ähm, dich, Max, und bin sehr, sehr gespannt. Ja, super, danke dir. Also, guten Morgen alle zusammen. Mein Name ist Max Cordex, CEO und Co-Founder of Lisk. Ähm, ich gebe die Präsentation auf Englisch, weil es gibt einfach so viele englische Begriffe in meiner Präsentation und ich bin es gewohnt, alles immer auf Englisch zu machen in der Blockchain-Industrie. Ähm, ich hoffe, das geht in Ordnung. Ähm, dann swipen wir mal direkt rein. Ähm, all right, okay, so today I'm going to give you a deep dive into blockchain interoperability with Lisk. And one more time in English, my name is Max Kordek, CEO and co-founder of Lisk. Please follow my channels if you want to stay up to date about Lisk and whatever else I'm working on in the blockchain industry. A quick disclaimer, um, blockchain is extremely hard, it's complex technology, so this presentation is also not easy. But I try to keep it as simple as possible. Sometimes I leave quite a bit away just to make it more understandable. Um, but I think it's just necessary if you want to do like well, proper either investments or evaluations of projects um, that you understand the technology behind and the team and what the team is trying to achieve. Further, I think um, this conference is a little bit more finance orientated. I'm not a finance guy, I'm a pure tech guy. So whatever you see here is just for information purposes. Uh, it's not investment advice or anything like that. I just want to tell you more about blockchain interoperability, a topic I'm working on since over five years already. Today in this presentation, I quickly give you an intro about what is Lisk and how to develop a blockchain application with our tools and platform. And then I go to explain you much more about blockchain interoperability with all these different techniques and mechanisms available on the market today, or at least on which other people are working on. And then after that, I'm going to explain you what we are working on, what we just revealed um, a few weeks ago the LISC interoperability solution. And I think it's pretty important for you to know what kind of advantages interoperability in general brings. So I go into that a little bit as well. And just then a few next steps for our research and for LISC in general, so that you're aware what's coming next and what I'm working on next. All right, so let's begin. So what is LISC? First of all, Lisk offers JavaScript developers all required tools to build the apps on their own native blockchain. And currently we work on an interoperability protocol, which will then connect these D apps to our blockchain, to the Lisk blockchain. And you see, we, or I mentioned D apps on their own native blockchain. And that's why we are calling them blockchain applications. We're not using the terminology D apps. We're using the terminology blockchain applications. And we launched in 2016, as previously announced, we acquired an old project from back in the day, um, somehow like an OG uh, ICO project, you could say that we have a team of around 40 people. Some are in Berlin, some are in Zug, 
Um, but the majority of the team actually sits in Berlin with all the developers, marketeers, researchers, business developers, and so on. And currently, we have a funding of around $100 million. Um, that all still stems from our ICO we conducted in 2016. Um, so we are well funded. We're here to stay. We're um, well a long-term project. We're not just a hype coin. Um, we really want to focus on delivering good technology. If you're looking into our ecosystem, I would say it has four core compo component, components. Um, the LISC SDK, which, uh, well, SDK stands for Software Development Kit, somehow like a toolbox for developers to build apps. And in our case, of course, it's a toolbox for JavaScript developers to build blockchain applications. Um, it's the Lisp blockchain, which we actually build ourselves with the Lisp SDK. And the Lisp blockchain is home to the LSK token and the centerpiece of the Lisp ecosystem. And with Lisp interoperability, which uh, is brand new, just announced a few weeks ago, I will go into details later about that. Um, Lisp interoperability then connects these blockchain applications JavaScript developers are developing with the Lisp SDK to our blockchain, to the Lisp blockchain, in order to create this ecosystem. And then the Lisp wallets, of course, provide the basic user interfaces for our platform. Um, our platform with interoperability is then a blockchain application platform on which multiple applications live and benefit from each other because this interoperability can create quite a synergy between the different apps. More about that later as well in advantages. And at the end of the day, what we try to achieve is to make blockchain accessible. And I'm not speaking here only for the normal user by providing them more use cases and a great user interface to benefit from blockchain technology, but also I speak about developers who have like a very high entry barrier entering the space in general because blockchain technology is extremely hard and developing your own blockchain application or just blockchain is really like expensive, time consuming and so on. When we started in 2016, we took an existing code base um, of like a project my partner Oliver Bellows and myself worked on before. And it took us around two years to bring that to stability and to a proper quality. And with the Lisk SDK, a developer nowadays can spin up their own blockchain within like one hour or something. And within probably like a week or so, they have a nice, simple proof of concept blockchain application already. So LISC is all about making blockchain accessible from the developer standpoint and the regular user standpoint. And I talked a lot, a lot about how to, um, or how to use the LISC SDK to build a blockchain application, but how does it exactly work? This is a bit technical now, but uh, please bear with me. So essentially the LISC SDK, again, software development kit, is a set of libraries, so something like a toolbox that are used to develop blockchain applications. Again, blockchain applications are D apps on their own native blockchain. Um, and it is comprised of multiple tools in that toolbox. One of them is Lisp Commander, which is just kind of like a um, command line interface uh, for developers to go in and generate like code skeletons and the basic blockchain, the white labeled blockchain to just get started. Um, the Lisp framework, which actually, like you could say, has all the heavy stuff in it, what makes your blockchain application actually then a decentralized blockchain. Um, and Lisk Elements, which um, is comprised of multiple libraries which handle very specific logic. For example, we have something called Lisk-Cryptography, um, which handles all stuff around cryptography, like it has all the different um, curves and, and algorithms for that in it. Um, we have one is, which is called Lisp P2P, which handles the peer-to-peer -peer layer um, for the network so that nodes can interact and communicate with each other. So this is all the software development kit. It's all there already. It's all published. It's all open source. It's free to use. Um, you can just jump on GitHub, uh, our organization that's called Lisp HQ, and can basically just install it today, npm install it, and you're there, ready to use and um, ready to build a blockchain application. 
So that tool is used to build a blockchain application. So keep that in mind. We have the Lisp blockchain and a blockchain application, um, which, for example, could serve a different use case, uh, like a prediction market, an oracle, a decentralized exchange, an NFT marketplace, an NFT game, whatever it is. Um, and if we're then talking about blockchain interoperability, it's um, like a very big topic which uh, got covered multiple times in the last few years. But just recently, we covered that topic with our own solution on ListJS 2021, which is our annual developer-focused event. So again, maybe not for you, but it's um, like pretty tech-savvy, pretty, like I would say, hardcore, uh, like developer-focused. And this time around, it was a pure digital event in 2019. Uh, it was a physical event only, this time a digital event. We had 1,000 plus registrations. Um, and normally we do this once a year, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to skip in 2020, but moved it then from end of the year to beginning of the year. So it was on the 21st and 22nd of May. Um, and now it's going to happen all the time in spring, so next year as well. Um, this time around, we had around 9,000 views so far, um, like pretty fast that went, so I'm very happy about that. It was a two days event, we had like nine hours of content, 450 slides, it was huge for us. Um, and there we presented the entirety of LISC interoperability. And you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, on our um, channel, Lisk HQ. So make sure to um, yeah to subscribe and watch the content if you're more tech savvy. Um, however, in blockchain uh, interoperability, there are many other solutions, and I would like to just give you also a bit of an overview about these. But before we do this, I want to explain you briefly what actually is interoperability. So I already said you have to keep in mind here, for example, the Lisk blockchain and another blockchain or blockchain application um, with a different use case. Let's just say blockchain one, blockchain two. And these two blockchains are now interoperable if like a transaction in one blockchain can have an effect in another. And that could be, for example, a token transfer from blockchain one to blockchain two. So let's say a user is like um, executing a transaction in blockchain one which has the purpose of transferring these tokens into blockchain two. But you have two distinct blockchains, two different networks. So you cannot just move it over. Um, what essentially happens is on the blockchain one, this action, this transaction is being um, called. And on blockchain two, it actually sees that and, well, is creating then these tokens, making them available um, for the user while on the blockchain one, they're kind of locked or burned. Um, that's why here on the presentation, it's also um, written like that on blockchain two, um, the users credited packed tokens because they're not really the original ones, but they are like a representation of them. So here I just gave you an example of a token transfer from blockchain one to blockchain two. That's like the interoperability everyone like is largely speaking about. But interoperability is also just if in blockchain one something happens, let's say a transaction is triggered, and then in blockchain two, because of that, something happens automatically, which might not actually be a token transfer, but it could be whatever it is. Like, it could be um, just a new transaction being called or triggered, and information becoming available, and so on. Um, and why is that so important? So, first of all, it's scalability. Um, if you're looking at Ethereum, um, where dApps are all written on its one blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain, um, obviously you're coming into scalability problems. So the Ethereum blockchain has limiting processing capabilities or capacity. Um, currently, they support around 18 transactions per second. And I think there are approximately like 2 million smart contracts or so like published on the Ethereum blockchain. Just a very small subset of them are actually being used, but uh, this just reveals the entire problem of scalability on, for example, Ethereum. That's why you have to pay like $70 in transaction fees sometimes. And um, if you now have interoperable blockchains, 
they essentially allow you to scale the processing cap capacity or the transactions per second with the number of connected chains. So in our case, um, if you build a blockchain application, it can handle um, around 75 transactions per second. So a few more than Ethereum currently and many more than Bitcoin currently. And you have to imagine every new blockchain application added to the ecosystem supports again 75 transactions per second. So if you have 1000 sidechains or blockchain applications in the ecosystem, you're speaking about 75,000 transactions per second. Um, of course, this only goes for each individual blockchain. If one blockchain becomes extremely successful, then, well, it runs into the same issues of scalability. If we're looking, however, at the most successful and popular um, yeah, DApp platform, Ethereum, and then again, the most popular DApp, I guess that's Uniswap, and they have like 300,000 transactions per day or something. Um, so with Lisk, with 75 transactions per second, you're approximately at 6.5 million transactions per day. So you're looking at like an, another like increase of 20x, whatever, um, of um, yeah, higher throughput. Um, so I guess that's quite nice for now um, and definitely solves the problem of scalability. Also, um, any other blockchain application then added to our ecosystem will never um, like suffer from this other blockchain, which is um, very successful because they're distinct. Um, so they're not running into any problems. And if the one blockchain application is actually hitting the ceiling, they could maybe like, like add another blockchain application, another sidechain to it, um, which, um, well, then again, like makes more room available. Um, and the other reason why interoperability is so important is just flexibility. So if you have one blockchain, you have just a limited set of use cases. For example, like um, you could have with Bitcoin, just payments um, or with Filecoin storage, but then with Ethereum, you have smart contracts, which expands that pretty much. However, it comes with certain sacrifices also on the code base um, for the different D apps. If you have your own blockchain application, your own blockchain, um, you can change everything you want. Like you can swap up, swap out the consensus algorithm. You can change the block time um, instead of making certain actions for each transaction. You could even make certain actions for each block coming in. Um, and now if you want to update your blockchain application, that's not a big problem because, well, all the other blockchain applications really don't have to update um, or go along with your, um, your protocol upgrade. So it comes with much more flexibility for the developer. They basically have full control over their blockchain application. All right. And now coming into these various methods of interoperability available on the market. So we're going to talk about four different ones um, which are currently being worked on or available. Um, atomic swaps with HDLCs, federated two-way pack, optimistic rollups and TT genius charting. Um, very, very high level. Just a very brief look into them. They're really complicated. Um, so I'm just going to like show you a few advantages and disadvantages. Um, very quick intro what they actually are. Um, but it serves more if you're interested then that you go to Google and just search for more material about these different techniques. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit more about cross-chain updates because that's actually our solution, what uh, we're working on. And then just for the sake of it, I added three other quite um, popular in the, in the media and news um, solutions as well. But we're not going to go into more detail because they're even more complex, um, which would be Plasma Framework, Homogeneous Sharding and Zero Knowledge Rollups. All right. So... You said, you heard before already, I said sometimes sidechain, blockchain one, whatever. Um, there are many different terms. So here's just a quick overview of different terminology these different techniques might use. Um, if we're talking about like blockchain one or like the main blockchain, if that exists, um, then it's sometimes referred to main chain or central shard. And if it's a second chain, um, then that's often a sidechain, a parachain, 
or just a shard. So don't get confused. Um, what you just have to know is you have different blockchains. A shard is not always a full blockchain, sometimes just a ledger, um, but for interoperability in itself, this doesn't matter. So the first method available on the market today, this is pretty old already, um, available since many years. Um, this is atomic swaps with HTLCs. HTLC stands for hash time locked contracts. And these contracts essentially are responsible to lock the tokens which should be swapped and then unlock them only um, if like a cryptographic proof is being revealed. A proof which shows that, well, the swap happened essentially. And the proof can be verified by both parties and has to be revealed by both parties. And if this does not happen on time, then, well, the swap will not happen because one of the parties can then say, no, okay, this has been now too long. Um, I don't want to do the swap anymore. Um, it's super simple to implement and trustless because it's directly peer-to-peer. -peer. However, it's quite slow because you always have to wait for the other party to essentially reveal the secret. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a swap, so only an exchange of tokens possible. It's not like a transfer of tokens, meaning um, it happened, for example, between Bitcoin and Monero. Um, it was possible to swap Bitcoins for Monero coin or however it's called, um, but you would not be able to transfer Bitcoin into the Monero blockchain with that. It's only an exchange of two different coins. Um, but it is there. It was uh, it was being used and practiced in the past already. So it's one of the available solutions for some something like interoperability. Then we have the federated two-way pack, another quite old but very like known and popular choice. Um, and there you have essentially a multi-signature account or like a group of trusted intermediaries. Um, so like a group of people like a a board or committee um, on both blockchains then, which are responsible to maintain a pack of the transferred token. So a pack essentially means if you have on blockchain one um, a token A and you want to send it into blockchain two, then this group or these intermediaries um, have to be responsible for destroying then this token on the one blockchain and creating it or minting it on the second blockchain. And this is the pack. So to make sure that suddenly you don't have the same tokens on both blockchains, um, because that would be then some something like a double spend, um, which obviously is not wanted. Um, again, this is quite simple and it's very fast because this uh, trusted intermediaries group is kind of small and they can speak with each other quite fast. Um, however, it is a small group, so it's not really decentralized. It um, depends how big this group is, but in most cases, that's like 12 people or something. So it has limited decentralization. And of course, it requires trust into these intermediaries. Um, one example is the Liquid Network, which is being used to um, like transfer Bitcoins between exchanges very fast. Um, so that they don't always have to go um, like over like the real blockchain and it's more like a side channel. Um, but this works uh, being practiced and if the intermediaries trust each other, they can essentially do the, these um, yeah, interoperable transactions very fast. Then another one is called optimistic rollups. Um, and here essentially, like if you have a side chain, all its blocks are optimistically posted on the main chain, but they're not being processed because else that would come with like scalability sacrifices. But um, all these blocks always then have somewhat of a stake as an insurance. And for some time, this block of the side chain can then be challenged um, if it's correct or not. And if it is correct, everything is good. And this is always assumed. Um, that's why it's called optimistic rollups. But if it's not correct, then the person who challenged that block can receive the small stake as a reward. So there's always essentially a, like an incentive to actually um, post the right sidechain blocks to say, okay, I'm honest, I, everything here is correct, because else the person is losing money. 
Um, and well, this comes with quite a flexible approach because you can just post them and you don't have to wait. Um, and it's very fast um, if the trust exists, if you um, like trust the person posting the sidechain block. However, if you don't trust the person, you always have to wait for this challenging period. And that can be then again very slow. So it depends who is posting the sidechain blocks. But then again, it's also kind of centralized because if you only um, rely on trusted um, like people here in this case, um, then it's not that decentralized either. And it's kind of complex to implement, uh, not that easy. Um, it is being used on Ethereum, I think, already today but not really as an interoperability solution again, but rather as a layer two solution. That means um, you have one sidechain, which uh, can then facilitate many different transactions. Um, and after some time, it's being like, like a sidechain block is then being posted on the main chain of Ethereum and all these transactions are then applied with that. Um, so you can have like a layer two on which like many transactions can happen for cheap. Um, but it's still Ethereum and it's not really a new blockchain for the sake of transferring a token between different blockchains, um, but rather to well decrease the fees because as I said before, Ethereum has quite a bit of a problem there right now. Then we have something with a very complicated name, heterogeneous sharding. Um, here you have shards, it's a pretty um, like popular term lately because Ethereum is working with Ethereum 2.0 on shards, um, but not on heterogeneous sharding, but then the homogeneous sharding. Um, but also Polkadot, a pretty big project lately, is also working on that. And here, essentially, every shard, that means like these sidechains, um, rely on a central shard for their security and interoperability. Um, and as long as the central shard is secure, they are secure as well. Um, so essentially, in Polkadot, for example, um, these shards are called power chains. And as long as the main Polkadot blockchain is secure and it's running, all these different power chains are running securely as well and can process their transactions. Um, that means like all these different new power chains, they don't need to have their own consensus algorithm and um, like have validators validating the blockchain but rather just always rely on the central chart. Um, this comes um, with certain advantages and disadvantages, of course. It's uh, very simple for new blockchains to be spun up because, well, they don't have to search for validators. Um, and it's quite a universal method, meaning each of these parachains can just rely on this mechanism. But it's extremely complicated, um, like really, really difficult stuff like cutting edge, like research and cryptography. And the number of shards are limited. Uh, currently in Polkadot, that's 100 um, because they all rely on the central shard and they're all getting their blocks validated there. Obviously, you're running at one point into scalability issues as well. And this comes with 100 parachains. Um, I'm sure Polkadot is working on that to increase that number, but that's the status quo. And then you have our solution, cross-chain updates or CCUs. And um, here, essentially, um, these cross-chain updates follow a specific structure, uh, which is understood by both blockchains. And um, in this structure, essentially, information about transactions can be included um, with the approval of each blockchain's um, validators. And with that, the blockchains know, OK, these transactions are valid and they can act as if these transactions then happened in each of these blockchains. And that is extremely fast and efficient because you don't have to wait for a challenge period or you um, don't have to wait for an intermediary group to accept it or something um, because both of these blockchains are being constantly pushed forward. Um, it's very scalable because, well, it's not limited, limited to a number of sidechains. Uh, like in Polkadot, you can have like theoretically like 10,000 sidechains uh, connected to the Lisp blockchain and um, yeah, send these cross-chain updates to all of these sidechains all the time. It's universal because each of these sidechains can use that. Um, even other projects are able to use our solution um, and more about that actually also later. Um, however, it requires a relayer. So someone who's sending um, such a cross-chain update um, 
which essentially collects all transactions which are meant to be sent from the main chain to a side chain and then post it onto the side chain. So someone needs to do that. In most cases, probably it's just someone who wants to facilitate that cross-chain transaction. Um, however, that's uh, that can be anyone. Um, that's a disadvantage. And of course, it requires that both or all blockchains actually follow this protocol one by one. Um, so here we have less flexibility, kind of, but this is the case for anything mentioned before as well. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty proud about that solution. I think it's fantastic and I will go into more detail now here. So let's explain you a bit more about how this all works. And again, it's a bit complicated, but I keep it very simple. So essentially, before we start explaining um, you the solution, I want to just let you know how much work that was and what went actually into that solution. So in um, 2019 at LISTJS, we revealed 35 LISC improvement proposals, which are somewhat like um, research papers. And they come or they came with various protocol improvements, like a new consensus algorithm, a new fee system, a new address system, and like a new multi-signature system, so many changes. And we are very close um, from publishing that to our blockchain now, one and a half ye years later, because at that time only the research was revealed and then it got implemented um, with an external uh, ex a security audit, uh, confirmed that it's secure, and then also Q8 internally. Um, we're hitting testnet quite soon, and uh, after that going to mainnet, so that happened before. But then from that point on, we focused on interoperability. And here we started with, first of all, like a state-of-the-art overview. So what you saw before, um, essentially just analyzing the existing um, methods and functionalities available. And I just gave you 1% of what we researched. The researchers we have, it's like five PhDs, super intelligent people. They can tell you so much more about that whole topic, but they essentially checked what solutions are available. And then together with my partner and my, uh, myself, um, they sat and discussed, okay, where do we want to take this? Because we're building a platform here, so it has certain directions it should take. Um, and um, well, that's pretty important that we come up with something which is supporting our vision and mission with LISC. Um, with that information, they then sat down and specified everything, had some more meetings with us as well in between, and then they wrote these LIPS, these LISC improvement proposals uh, or research papers, which got then published on this GS 2021, which was just recently on the 21st and 22nd of May. And, well, these LIPS, um, we divided them between core LIPS and supporting LIPS, where the core lips, which uh, are like 12 of them in total, cover the complete interoperability specifications. Um, that's the old slide. It was, of course, not um, presented today. It was presented at ListJS, but I go into a bit more detail um, later into, this, uh, into these core lips. Um, and it got published the day after ListJS um, on the research forum available on research.list.com. Um, where you can take a look. We are currently collecting community feedback. And um, then once we got enough feedback, publishing it as a full on specified lib on GitHub with the number. So it's like kind of cemented and um, yeah, fully published. And then next to these 12 core libs, which really include the complete interoperability solution, we also have like um, supporting changes um, which um, have to be introduced to our protocol. And here we're talking about 14 supporting LIPS. Five of them already got published on the research forum before the event. Um, and in the coming weeks, we will um, publish the other nine, um, which just like introduce a few other changes in our protocol required to be able to implement the core LIPS. Um, and all these LIPS are defined in eight roadmap objectives, which we're working on. Um, these are the ones. It's once the defined sidechain registration and lifecycle. As I said, we are a platform, so we want that sidechains register on our LISC blockchain. Um, 
so that we are also becoming somewhat like of an app catalog. We are aware which apps exist. Um, then the cross-chain messaging protocol, which kind of um, introduces this technique, how like the information of a transaction on blockchain one can become available on blockchain two. Um, then something very complicated about state models and state routes, uh, not so interesting for now. Um, then our LISC BFT um, consensus algorithm needs to be updated. BFT stands for Bits and Thin Fault Tolerance. Um, in our case, it's responsible to uh, finalize transactions on the blockchain and cement them. And with that, I mean, after a certain time, it's impossible to revert a transaction once it's in. Uh, in our case, that's like 20 minutes later. Um, and that's very important because if you send a transaction from one chain to another, you want to make sure to wait that period um, to yeah, be able to know that on the original um, blockchain where it's coming from, this transaction can never be reverted again. Um, you might have heard that from Bitcoin or other blockchains like a reshuffling at the end of the blockchain. Um, that's why in, Ethereum, uh, in, in Bitcoin, you always have to wait like at least one confirmation, but ideally six confirmations um, to make sure that this block will not be reverted anymore with 99.999% um, probability. But in our case, it's then a clear like 100%. At least that's what I would say. Our researchers probably would disagree um, with this probability number, but it's like near 100%. Um, then we're introducing new token standards, ones for regular tokens and ones for NFTs, non-fungible tokens, because they obviously have to be transferred from one blockchain to another. Um, then again, something very technical to update the block header format. Um, and then I talked about flexibility of our sidechains. So by default, we are supporting two consensus algorithms, which can be replaced by the developer. This is um, delegate proof of stake, which is already there today. And well, we are having this objective of introducing an alternative uh, consensus algorithm, which is POA or proof of authority, where essentially I think very interesting for businesses, you can just define who is the validator um, and these validators are then uh, like re responsible to secure the blockchain. So that could be, for example, let's say we have the digital euro um, and then in Germany we have the Deutsche Bank, the Commerzbank, N26, uh, Solaris Bank and a few others which are then these um, authorities um, and make sure to secure the blockchain. Not sure I would uh, trust that, but um, that's how it works. You have these trusted um, parties securing the blockchain then in this POA consensus algorithm. And last one is again very technical to enhance our signature scheme. Again, not so interesting for today. So let's dive into that uh, whole LISC interoperability topic then. Um, the basic idea is again, you have a LISC main chain in our case and a LISC side chain. And now you want to send um, transactions, let's say from um, the, let's just say from the main chain to the side chain um, or from the side chain to the main chain, then these transactions actually emit something called a cross chain message. And these CCMs basically um, signal that this is a transaction meant for another blockchain. Um, and these messages are then gathered um, and post it on the other blockchain as a CCU and cross-chain update. And a bit more detailed, it means um, when you have all these cross-chain messages then on the sending chain, um, they are being gathered into one certificate um, and then a relayer relays that certificate in a cross-chain update to the other chain. So they post it um, on the other chain but this cross-chain update includes the um, signatures of the validators of the sending chain. So on the sending chain, it was basically confirmed already and proven that these transactions which happen, um, which information is available in the cross-chain message in the CCM, um, are all valid. That's why the relayer can just post it on the receiving chain, let's say the side chain, and um, assume this is all good. Um, this is like safe. And here, however, we need to wait then 
for these 20 minutes that um, the sending chain is essentially reaching a finalized status and nothing can be reverted anymore um, so that yeah we are running into uh, we are like a hundred percent secure um, that's essentially our interoperability solution so again you have transactions on the sending chain let's say LISC transactions which are um, meant to be sent into a LISC sidechain and um, like here I'm talking about the LSK token sent from the main chain to the sidechain. And each of these transactions meant for this one sidechain have like a cross-chain message with all the information in it. Um, that means proof that it's all uh, properly, um, like that the owner of this LSK actually has them, um, the amount, and the recipient, whatever it is, the receiving chain information and so on. And then a relayer again takes these messages puts them into a certificate and include that certificate into a cross-chain update, which is a new transaction on the sidechain to make sure that these transactions of LSK tokens meant for the sidechain can then on the sidechain uh, be credited to the user and then used there without any problem. Okay, pretty complex, but that's how it works. Um, and well, for us, there's a whole journey behind the sidechain and it starts with bringing it to life. So essentially this is a registration transaction in which you um, on the main chain register your sidechain or your blockchain application. And there you can give it a name. Um, let's say um, we are calling it um, a prediction market. Um, and then each of these registered sidechains have an ID of the Genesis block um, and uh, of the sidechain and the genesis block is es essentially the very first block of a blockchain so um, in the case of bitcoin um, you might have heard that the genesis block has a quote in it um, which uh, is being taken from the front cover of a newspaper of 2019 about the financial crisis back then um, and that that's the genesis block the first block of the bitcoin blockchain and in our case, you're spinning up new blockchains with your blockchain application. So you also have a Genesis block. And well, to make sure that um, when you're facilitating a cross-chain update, a cross-chain transfer, um, and it's be, it should always arrive at the right blockchain. So this Genesis uh, block ID um, is used then to compute the sidechain network ID so that when you facilitate these token transfers cross chain, uh, you always send it to the right sidechain and not to another one, which might be malicious. Um, and then um, during registration, you also have to, um, well, include in that registration the sidechain validators, um, which, well, will send the first cross chain update from the sidechain to the main chain in order to signal, well, I'm alive. But that's all pretty much automatic. You will not have to worry about that as a user, but as a developer, that's pretty important. Um, and these, well, some of these values, like a Genesis block, for example, you can just simply auto-generate with the list commander, which I mentioned before is one of the products within the list SDK. All right, and then once you registered um, your sidechain with this new transaction, um, your sidechain account is created on the main chain. Don't get confused by account. It's essentially just an object saying this sidechain now exists with this ID, with this name, and so on. And well, when you um, like do that, you have then essentially established one, one connection. And that means like from the main chain to the side chain. And uh, just quickly about this chain ID, um, like on the main chain, then each side chain has such an ID and it's just being counted up while the ID one is the list main chain itself. And then every side chain gets like just two or three and four and five and so on. And this is just needed in order to know which chain is which um, because you're dealing with an underlying protocol it somehow needs to know um, where it's sending the cross-chain transactions to. And if we're going the other way around, um, I mentioned now a link is essentially established from the main chain to the side chain. However, you also need to know 
on the side chain than where the main chain is. So you have a similar registration on the side chain as well, where you define the main chain. So it finds the tokens always find the way back essentially, but this is kind of uh, also automatic. You don't have to do a lot here. Um, it's all provided for in the tools we provide in the Lisk SDK. So with that, we essentially have a registration process where a developer can say, okay, hey, I developed my own blockchain application. I now want to register it on the Lisk blockchain application platform. They go to our Lisk wallets, click like essentially at a, at a blockchain application or register blockchain application, uh, insert these few values like a name, for example, and then it's live, it's res registered, and they can at one point then decide to turn the blockchain, the sidechain on. Um, that doesn't have to happen immediately. It can also happen at a later point. Um, and that's what I just was talking about. Um, it can also be like happen at a later point, this activation of the sidechain. Um, this will happen essentially with the first CCU um, posted um, so that, well, then the main chain knows, ah, okay, now it's an active sidechain. Before that, it's not an active one, but these cross-chain updates always have to happen to signal to the main chain, okay, here the sidechain is alive and kicking and has still a user base. And if we are now talking about how to um, like send from one sidechain to another sidechain, then we decided to have something called main chain routing. Um, that's where like the main chain is always in the middle between. Um, that's why the list blockchain I called it initially is the centerpiece of our platform and ecosystem. So if you want to send a token now from sidechain one to sidechain two, let's say sidechain one is um, like an NFT collectible game where you have something like Crypto Kitty, but then sidechain two is something like an NFT marketplace and you want to sell it. Then you have to go over the main chain into the sidechain again. And here it's again the same stories as before. You facilitate the transaction on the sidechain. Um, with that, a CCM is being created containing all information. A relayer is uh, including that into a certificate and which is included in the cross-chain update on the main chain. And there then um, either directly or later um, when another cross-chain transaction happens to sidechain 2, um, this information is then encapsulated again in the CCM, um, included into a certificate, and that certificate is then posted on sidechain 2 in a CCU. So that's how sidechain to sidechain uh, cross-chain transactions actually happen. Then, talking about terminating a sidechain, I just talked about how um, you can register a sidechain, bringing it to life. But at one point, it might also be over for a sidechain, either because it has no users anymore, it's not secure anymore, um, it's not being maintained or just dies, whatever it is. And um, for that, we introduce something like a termination. On the one side, we have something like a, like a forced termination, um, because we think if such a CCU, a cross-chain transaction, is not happening at least for one month, um, then the sidechain is actually not participating in the ecosystem and it's not needed to like, like waste space in, 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 on the nodes of the main chain. Um, so that's why after one month of being inactive, it's being terminated. And now you, now you might think, okay, hey, but what if um, that's actually to my disadvantage because the sidechain is still um, active, well, you can always just post a CCU quickly. It's very cheap. Um, just it will then have actually no cross-chain transactions included, maybe. Um, but that proves then, hey, the sidechain is still alive. However, if a sidechain is not alive anymore, the users really have to have a mean, uh, like a, a means to um, be able to retrieve their tokens, and that's part of this termination process. Why we decided to have that. Um, so as soon as like this connection or sidechain is terminated, you will not be able to send any more tokens into this sidechain. Um, but if um, like, well, the most important thing is that you then actually send the tokens out of the sidechain, right? Um, 
But um, well, here it just quickly describes that well, this termination can also happen if a sidechain is malicious and it tries to send malformed data. For example, it tries to send tokens to the main chain which ex actually don't exist. And that's, there's a mechanism in place which detect that in order to make sure everything's secure and safe. However, um, once it's terminated, um, it's disconnected. And you cannot send any more tokens into the sidechain. That's okay. However, you want to take the tokens out of the sidechain, of course. Either you have stored NFTs there, LSK tokens or other tokens. Um, you want, of course, be able to retrieve them. And for that, we introduce a new transaction type called the sidechain recovery transaction. And that's a fully trustless, secure on-chain process, how you can get the tokens then back. It's not something centralized when the developer of the sidechain has to do something. It's fully decentralized, on-chain and trustless. And essentially is the mechanism um, to be able to retrieve tokens from a sidechain back to either the main chain or its original sidechain it stemmed from. And well, this uh, recovery mechanism um, will be able to prove that you're the owner of uh, certain tokens, like an NFT or just the LSK token, for example. Um, but this recovery mechanism can um, be conducted by anyone. It doesn't have to be even you. So if you're less technical, you don't know that maybe um, that mechanism exists. Um, someone else can do it for you um, and essentially recover every token on the sidechain at once. Um, and I don't need to really go into detail here. It's again a bit more complex, but with that it means, let's say you had quite a few tokens in a decentralized exchange. All these different tokens would go back to the original sidechain. You have some NFTs in the marketplace. They would all go back to, let's say, the collectible game they stem from. So you're fully protected from malfunctioned or inactive sidechains. Um, however, all tokens which, well, originally come from that one sidechain, let's say you have um, something like an Oracle chain and this Oracle chain has its own Oracle coins. Well, if the Oracle chain is being terminated because it's uh, not secure anymore, it malfunctioned uh, or it's not active anymore and that's why it's being terminated, then these tokens are kind of lost as well. However, if there's a situation where this termination actually happened uh, by mistake um, because this inact inactivity was uh, on purpose or something, um, then of course the sidechain still lives and continues. It's just not connected to the LISC ecosystem anymore. But then if it's all running safely there, um, your Oracle coins are still available within the chain. You just cannot send them to another LISC sidechain anymore. Um, but then for that, you would have to register a new sidechain and uh, make the initial token distribution same as on that one Oracle sidechain uh, in order to be able to participate in our ecosystem again. Um, so if we're taking a look at the whole life cycle of a sidechain, it essentially means you're first developing your own blockchain application with the LISC SDK. And once it's done, it's completed, um, you can generate the Genesis block, the first block of the sidechain. Uh, and with that, um, you can register your sidechain on the LISC main chain. Then, well, you can wait a month, two days, whatever, mm. before, it's, uh, before you activate that sidechain on the main chain um, with a cross-chain transaction, making the main chain avail uh, aware that this sidechain exists. And then it's active and users can send tokens around from the main chain to the side chain and back. Um, they can benefit from the use case and utility the side chain brings. Let's say it's a DEX or an NFT game, whatever it is, um, and all good. And normally this should just go on for every serious side chain forever um, because the advantage of blockchains is as long as there are some people willing to run it, it can run forever, right? Um, However, maybe the sidechain was not developed correctly um, and therefore they sent some malfunction data um, or it's just broken completely and um, the blockchain is actually stopped. Um, after one month, then um, it's going to get terminated. And that's where then the user can recover the tokens on it um, 
and well retrieve all all their initial money back or nfts back um and yeah this is just like as a fail safe as a side if a sidechain really is not behaving correctly but in ideal situations this should never happen yeah that's the life cycle so from uh, a to z uh, from beginning to end um but i think in most cases um yeah the termination will actually not be um kickstarted because a sidechain should always be able to run um forward and then quickly again just to to give you this understanding uh, one more time um so there's a bit of a noise here so um if you're sending tokens from one sidechain to another sidechain this happens not directly this happens more like um over the main chain like i explained before and um that's pretty important for us because we want to like establish the list main chain as the centerpiece and if now side chains communicate directly it gets very complicated with different token states in different chains um, and then the other chains are not really aware how many tokens are where um, but also because with our wallet we really want to provide this user interface which enables you to benefit from our ecosystem and this will create then synergies between the different side chains being active in our ecosystem and uh, for that i want to tell you a little bit more about the advantages blockchain interoperability brings so in the case of lisk so i mentioned that before with flexibility but you can also say it's customizability um, the advantages of well having interoperable blockchains instead of having your dApps on one blockchain from the beginning like in the case of ethereum is um, essentially you have you can have tokens in your sidechain and they can easily be moved between the different sidechains so there's no disadvantage in that but you also on top of that can pretty much change anything in the blockchain you created so you can replace the consensus algorithm um, we already said we are uh, having delegate proof of stake depots already and are currently working on the proof of authority uh, consensus algorithm which was the seventh objective on the slide earlier um, but you can also introduce like an inflational re reward block rewards um, or um, like decide to not have them you can reduce the block time and so on um, then it's somewhat like a unit um, there's an ecosystem being created because if you now have different blockchains well it's like different ecosystems right you you have let's say um the chain link army the ripple uh guys which is maybe not really a blockchain but then bitcoin ethereum lisk uh, monero you have all these different blockchains and it's somehow like each of these blockchain communities well it's like religion or something they're really big fanboys of their own blockchain but they hate every other blockchain it's not always the case but online it often appears so that this is the case um because everyone has a financial incentive to well push their own investment their own blockchain to the sky while destroying the other projects um i don't like that and that's why um interoperability is so important because that will create like some kind of a of an ecosystem um, and in the list case, of course, here in the illustration, this is just shown between the list blockchain and all these different sidechains being created on our platform. As you would have again the same situation, you could create a new Ethereum, a new Monero, um, or whatever, um, new, a new Polkadot, a new Cosmos with the list SDK. But we don't want it. We want them all to be connected. But then the ultimate goal is, of course, to connect then all these blockchains again. To other ecosystems like connecting them to the ethereum ecosystem to the polkadot ecosystem to the cosmos ecosystem and so on so yeah this is pretty important for interoperability uh, to happen then that this sense of ecosystem uh, is there um, because um, well i think projects are suffering from this competition uh, while there are many crypto projects out there doing a tremendous job in innovating this technology and we all have a purpose to be um, 
and we should actually rather benefit from each other instead of suffering from each other. In the case of uh, LISC, now to come to the slide, um, so in our sense, it's of course also an ecosystem. That's our whole idea of having a platform. Um, and the LSK token is being um, used as like the common ecosystem token. So this will be the main choice for every sidechain. Um, and on every sidechain, you have to pay the transaction fees in LSK. Of course, because the sidechain is created from scratch with the LISC SDK, a developer has full flexibility and can say, okay, no, I don't want the LSK token. I want only my own token. That's also possible. Um, but by default, it's LSK um, because it's much simpler for the user experience. As it's written here also, everyone has the same address because of shared cryptography in every sidechain and the main chain. Um, and then it's just much easier that you only need the LSK token for the ecosystem to operate. Um, you don't need this new coin to use the prediction market. You don't need that new coin to use the Oracle system or that new coin to use the DEX. No, just LSK for every single blockchain application. Um, and yeah, that creates this uh, simplification. We are all about making blockchain accessible. So user in the best case scenario only needs LSK. And this of course will also drive the demand up for the token and make it a much more successful um, cryptocurrency widely used um, and that well means it's on more exchanges users again are easier to get into our ecosystem by themselves a few tokens just to participate in the use cases these sidechains then deliver and just a quick example to show you the power of interoperability and well, in this case now, you might feel like, okay, it's the LISC main chain and the side chains all LISC, but really it's different blockchains. You could even say if, for example, Bitcoin implements that, you could facilitate that between LISC and Bitcoin or then Bitcoin to Ethereum and Ethereum to Cardano and Cardano to Cosmos, these kind of things. Um, but now to keep it simple, the LISC main chain and different side chains in our ecosystem. So let's say you have LSK token and you want to exchange them for BAT coins. And for that, you send them into a decentralized exchange um, and facilitate that swap. And then you want to use these bet coins to participate in a prediction who the next winner of the Nobel Prize is. So you're sending them over the main chain into the prediction market. And there they stay the list tokens, um, waiting then for another sidechain, an Oracle sidechain, to um, be aware of who the winner is and feeding or relaying that information then, which is also interoperability, but just without a token transfer, just an information transfer, to the prediction market to resolve the bet. And well, of course, you won. So you want some uh, more LSK tokens um, because other users bet that bet on another Nobel Prize winner um, and you get part of their tokens then in this case. And then you have more LSK tokens. You can send them into a gaming chain to participate or buy an NFT, whatever. So you see all these different blockchain applications can then interact with each other, creating a very strong synergy. And um, while well, I always compare it to like a brain which just grows um, like with more fun functionality, more use cases, um, and with every new sidechain plugged into the main chain, essentially more utility comes to the platform. And I think that's like where the true power lies and where we today don't even realize what will be able um, or what will be possible um, with interoperability or thanks to interoperability. But it's very important to keep in mind Mm, that if you have these side chains, um, they are independent, but thanks to interoperability, not isolated. What that, does that mean? So independent means, I mentioned that before already, if one side chain becomes extremely successful, let's say it's a decentralized exchange, uh, which is the most popular use case on Ethereum currently, um, and it's hitting the, the limits, the ceiling, it cannot process transactions anymore for cheap because it has 6 million transactions per day, um, theoretically more. Um, then, of course, this owner of the sidechain could spin up a second decentralized exchange and relay some of the traffic over there. It's similar like back in the day, World of Warcraft also has multiple servers, right, to distribute the traffic. 
Um, however, the most important aspect for our ecosystem or platform is that no matter how busy one sidechain is, all the other sidechains don't even realize that because they're independent. They're like their own distinct blockchains. So they never suffer from very popular blockchain applications. We had a few years ago CryptoKitties, which um, showed that or revealed that problem on Ethereum, that one application became very successful and the entire platform became very expensive to use because the fees rose. In our case, this would not be the case. Um, so that's one of the big advantages. Um, and that plays into, well, general scalability. Um, if these transactions are separated away into their own separate blockchains, then of course, um, like you have a much more scalable platform. Um, I mentioned before, like we successfully tested uh, 75 transactions per second per sidechain. Um, you could have a thousand sidechains connected at 75,000 transactions per second. Um, throwing these wild numbers around, of course, is not always um, helpful, but in this case, you have to imagine it's spread between 1,000 different chains. That means 1,000 different networks. Um, so this is like reality and not just a high number for marketing purpose. Um, and then, but of course, this will come then with a huge number of nodes. It will be then a very big thing if we will have in the future 1,000 sidechains. Um, but then because of this fragmentation or like, I, not isolation, but like um, focusing the transactions of different apps into their own sidechains, the fees should generally be much cheaper. Um, the reason why fees on Ethereum are so high is that each block in the blockchain has a limited amount of transactions it can include. So everyone is just competing with all the other participants on uh, getting their transaction in. And the miners on Ethereum, which create the block, of course, always choose uh, transactions with the highest fees because the fee goes to the miner. So that's where like a, something like a competition starts or like an auction um, and the highest fees get included. Now, if you have 100,000 transactions, but only 1,000 transactions fit into a block, of course, people are going to ramp up the fee until their transaction gets included into a block. But if you don't have um, that many transactions and every transaction user sent can actually directly be implemented or included in the block, then users don't have to compete with higher fees and the fees stay generally low. Um, checking the numbers, we are like 20x away from um, the most successful use ca case on Ethereum. So with that, I think we have a very long way to, um, to, to operate cheaply and efficiently. And like I said, in the worst case, a sidechain can always spin up a second sidechain to um, distribute its traffic a little bit more. Um, but then the most important thing, all these independent blockchain applications or sidechains, they can interact and benefit from each other. Um, so that means like a DEX, well, can accept all these different tokens in the ecosystem and can make exchanges possible. Um, the prediction market can get information from an Oracle system. It's all connected. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful. All right, that's interoperability. I tried to explain some stuff again and again to make it a bit more simple to understand. But you maybe have like noticed a few weaknesses in our own solution. And that's essentially our next steps for LISC research, because now that we spent all that time from LISC 2019 to now LISC 2021, one and a half years, um, researching our initial interoperability solution, coming up with these um, five supporting LIPs already published, um, 12 core LIPs published at LISC 2021, and then these nine additional supporting LIPs coming in the next few weeks, we needed to... Uh, just check, okay, where can we improve our solution? We have to start with something, but always possible to improve it. And, well, that's where um, we introduce this milestone five, like a new phase where interoperability is improved. Um, and there we essentially have three goals um, to reduce the time to finality that plays into the BFT consensus algorithm, where I said before it takes like 20 or 25 minutes or so on average 
um, to um, yeah, cement a transaction on one chain so it's never be possible to revert that. And that's important if you send a transaction into another chain. So we need to reduce that time, of course. And this relayer, which was one of the disadvantages of our solution, where someone has to actively post a cross-chain update onto another chain, um, which of course is a transaction and costs a little bit of money. Um, well, there's no incentive for that unless the person, the relayer uh, relaying that information is actually someone who actually sent a transaction from one chain to another. So we somehow need to incentivize that person so that everyone in the network actually wants to relay uh, these cross-chain updates. And um, while well, sidechains are, are that flexible and that customizable that the fee system, which I explained before with the auctioning um, and the competition um, for competing to get included into a block, well, it, because sidechains can be that customizable, we need to generalize our fee system a little bit more. But there I will not go into details um, in the following slides that's uh, unrelevant to interoperability. And then, um, well, I already hinted towards it. That's just the first step, LISC interoperability, to be able to connect sidechains to the LISC main chain. Um, but we think bigger. We think that we need to establish interoperability to third-party ecosystems as well. And candidates here include uh, Ethereum, Polkadot, Cardano, and Cosmos. Um, so these, we think, are the most prominent blockchain application platforms currently available with, of course, uh, Polkadot and Cardano still being heavily in development. Cosmos is a little bit further ahead uh, and Ethereum is live since quite a while. And this is like the holy grail for me to establish interoperability with projects like these in order to yeah, bring all the utility also to the LISC platform. So let's go quickly into a bit more detail. So reducing the time to finality. Like I said, if you want to um, transfer um, from one sidechain to the main chain or from a ma main chain to a sidechain, you need to wait that this um, that uh, until these transactions are final or that one or that the blockchain is finalized when you were um, at the time of when you were sending the transaction, so that both chains know by nearly 100% that um, yeah, the transaction sent actually is valid and that the user still has it. Um, else you could send a transaction into a side chain, but then very quickly after a transaction to another account on the main chain, um, and then because of the time gap, um, well, it would be accredited to the sidechain, but also to the other account on the main chain. So it's a double spend. So we, you, you always need to wait that time. Um, yeah, here it says on average 26 minutes. Um, I think it's around that, um, like 20, 26 minutes. Um, and um, we now have the goal to decrease that time. So by introducing a new BFT consensus algorithm, um, which reduces it to one or two blocks, that means like 20 seconds, um, which would make it blazing fast to send cross-chain updates or cross-chain transactions. Um, and of course, that comes with a better user experience because you don't always want to wait like half an hour um, to use the sidechain's utility. However, I actually think this is not like super um, required when we start because you might send some LSK tokens into a sidechain um, and might take half an hour, but then you leave the tokens there, you use the use case, um, the utility of that sidechain, and maybe days or weeks or maybe never um, later, you're going to send the tokens back. So um, that's like just a user experience improvement. But I think for the utility of our platform, um, not really necessary to do. But of course, should be done to make it better. And then this relay incentivization. So the person who's relaying the CCU currently is not being incentivized. They actually have to pay a small fee to be able to post that transaction. So now we need to provide a good incentivization mechanism so that, um, well, users have a higher chance of getting their cross-chain transactions relayed faster. Mm. Again, kind of a UX situation. Again, it's just about improving our solution. And then uh, the fee system, I will not go into, but then the next phase will be blockchain interoperability. 
um, with candidates including, like mentioned, Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, and Cardano, where essentially we are building then um, our own sidechain or blockchain application, which is connected to these ecosystems, so that, for example, you are able to um, send Ethereum or ERC20 tokens from, eth from the Ethereum ecosystem to that, um, like, App we are, side chain we are creating, and then it's within the Lisk ecosystem, and then you can send it to any other side chain to exchange it on a decentralized exchange, for example. Um, we believe this is super helpful because then Lisk also becomes something like a second layer solution for Ethereum, um, and can ben and then Ethereum can benefit, for example, from the cheaper fees on the Lisk platform. Users can benefit of having only one wallet, uh, the Lisk wallet installed, for example, because there they can also hold any ERC20 token on Ethereum itself. However, then as these packed um, tokens or wrapped tokens within the Lisk sidechain we are creating here. Um, I think that's the true goal. If you're looking on our website, we have um, published just recently a new roadmap with gemstones as their own distinctive phases. We're currently in the well, Emerald phase with these protocol improvements I mentioned before, when they go live on mainnet in like quite relatively soon, um, then we are enter entering the new phase, the Sapphire phase, which is about LISC interoperability with the research completed. Um, just these two improvements there still being uh, implemented then later. And that's where all the development work is being targeted to right now. Um, you know, to implement LISC interoperability as soon as possible. And then after that, um, it's the diamond phase where we're implementing blockchain interoperability. This research will start later this year. Um, and yeah, I'm quite uh, curious what our team will come up there with. Um, and for LISC, very quickly, the next steps uh, goes also a little bit to the past. We just launched LISC.com. We had the domain LISC.io before, but we Finally, after five and a half years, able to get the com domain as well, came with a little bit of a website refresh as well. We had ListJS, two-day event targeted to developers. Generally, Lisk is a tech project, so you see the whole presentation was a bit more complicated. Um, with that, we launched our first online hackathon called Hack on Lisk. More information on hackonlisk.com. Um, which goes still until 23rd of July, where you can use the Lisk SDK to um, participate um, in it and build your own blockchain app. Prices are 33,000 US dollar in total. Um, then we launched a list grant program um, where if you are a team of two at least and you want to build a blockchain application with the list SDK, you can get 66,000 US dollar from us um, to start building. Um, it's divided in milestones because we want an ecosystem with great use cases. So we are supporting teams building these use cases. Then, like I just said, LISC interoperability implementation has just began Im immediately after LISC uh, 2021. Um, and, well, currently I'm in the LISC Center Berlin. If you take a look, uh, that's written at the wall. Um, it's based in Berlin, uh, as the name suggests, and it's a co-working space where everyone can just come um, and work from here, we have coffee or other drinks available for free. We have internet here, um, a meeting room, uh, also with a ping pong table there. We have some more games, um, yeah, Raspberry Pis, um, a 3D printer, um, a paper wallet printer. We have the Lisk wallets installed here on the computer and on the phone. Um, and yeah, you can just use it as a shared space to exchange ideas and to talk with other people about blockchain. It's not LISC exclusive. Um, we have also a stage here um, with a big projector to be able to facilitate meetups. So if you want to have a meetup, you can just contact us and, well, use this space then um, for your own meetup, either blockchain related or programming development related. Uh, everything for free, like I said, and we have the same thing also in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, so once, well, COVID-19 is over and we are allowed to open again, I hope in July, uh, please come over. It's at Köpenicker Straße 126 in Berlin. Uh, I think it's Kreuzberg Mitte. Um, so make sure to check that out. But you will hear about it when it opens. 
And then this mainnet version 3, that's with all these protocol improvements I mentioned before, the new fee system, the new address system, the new consensus algorithm, and so on, uh, which was which research was revealed at LISC.js 2019, uh, will launch this fall. Um, then after that, because it comes with a complete new API, we're going to also getting listed on more exchanges again um, to simplify the onboarding of people into our ecosystem because they will require the LSK token to use it. And then at the end of the year, again, like an in-between update um, annually um, called LISC updates, where then you can hear more about our progress made on the research and implementation of interoperability. Um, and also about our own blockchain applications, which we are starting to develop. Um, finally, this was always our goal, that at one point we're actually then also implementing new blockchain application use cases, which are then being used by the people on the street. Um, and um, bringing them like real advantages. I said in an interview before, my dream is that someone on the street just uh, opens their Lisk wallet and actually benefits from blockchain technology. Um, and here we have three blockchain applications planned. The first one is something called the Lisk Bridge. That's this blockchain interoperability to another ecosystem. Let's say, for example, Ethereum, so that you have every token of Ethereum available also in the Lisk ecosystem, and they can benefit then from, let's say, a DEX in our ecosystem or an NFT marketplace or whatever it is. Um, and then two other DeFi applications where we cannot say much more right now because it's still pending legal opinions and more research before we want or can reveal more. So a lot is happening. A lot was said. That's it with my presentation. Thank you so much. And now I'm available um, for some questions. It was super complicated. Um, so I hope uh, you got everything. And Max... Wir können es auch auf Deutsch machen. Ja, genau, richtig. Mhm. Wow, vielen, vielen, vielen Dank. War mega, mega faszinierend. Ähm, ich, der Coworking Space öffnet, sobald äh, Corona das zulässt. Ne? Ja, genau. Ja. Er ist offen, sobald ähm, ja, Merkel sagt, ihr könnt wieder öffnen. Ähm, ich denke im Juli. Also jetzt die Zahlen und so sehen es eher vielversprechend aus. Man kann ja schon Events haben bis 100 Leute. Aber ähm, ja, wenn wir öffnen, wollen wir auch öffnen und dann offen bleiben, ohne jetzt hier irgendwelche Risiken einzugehen. Sehr, sehr cool, ja. Ich, ich habe auch gemerkt, viele ähm, Zuschauer sind auch die ganze Zeit über dran geblieben. Also ich glaube, du hast die auch gecatcht. Und äh, jetzt nochmal an dich als Zuschauer. Schreib auf jeden Fall, wenn du Fragen hast, die jetzt sofort in den Chat. Ich habe auch noch ein paar Fragen aufgeschrieben. Mhm. Ähm, genau, und wir haben jetzt noch Fragen von M4Log. Will the list, okay, das ist jetzt eine englische Frage, aber... Gucken wir mal. Will the list SDK also be compatible with other programming languages in the future or will it remain with Java? Ja, ähm, also die Frage geht dahin, ob das Lisk SDK kompatibel mit anderen Programmiersprachen sein wird oder nur mit Java. Einerseits ganz kurz, ähm, Java ist eine komplett andere Sprache als JavaScript. Ähm, also was komplett anderes. Ähm, dann gibt es einen Joke, um, ist so wie, die haben so viel miteinander zu tun wie Car und Carpet. Das ist einfach um, was ganz anderes. Um, aber danke für die Frage. Um, also wir sind total darauf fokussiert, Blockchain accessible zu machen. Und JavaScript ist die meistverbreiteste Programmiersprache der Welt. Das können Millionen von Leuten. Essentie äh, essentiell jeder Programmierer kann JavaScript auch. Um, Heutzutage fast jede App, die man benutzt, nutzt auch JavaScript. Ähm, also irgendwie Slack, Trello, ähm, was gibt es noch? Ähm, einfach so viel, auch auf dem Handy, so viel nutzt einfach JavaScript heutzutage. Ähm, und es fühlt sich auch sehr nativ an. Also es ist wirklich eine Sprache der Zukunft. Ähm, und deswegen haben wir uns von Anfang an dazu entschieden, wir bleiben rein bei JavaScript. Das heißt, unser komplettes SDK ist implementiert in JavaScript. Ähm, weil es einfach fast jeder kann und es mit bestimmten ähm, Vorteilen kommt. Ähm, zum Beispiel, du musst JavaScript nicht kompilieren. Das heißt, du kannst es direkt laufen lassen, du kannst es im Browser laufen lassen, du kannst es auf jedem Gerät mittlerweile ähm, laufen lassen, ohne es für dieses Gerät speziell kompilieren zu müssen. Ähm, aber wenn du mal so in andere Projekte guckst, ähm, ein SDK ist wirklich komplett der Baukasten mit allem, was du brauchst für deine Blockchain-App. 
aber dann alle oder viele andere Projekte sagen, okay, aber wir haben ein SDK in 30 Sprachen. Das ist gar nicht das SDK mit all diesen Bauteilen. Das ist dann nur ein, ein Rapper, welcher die API abbildet in einer anderen Programmiersprache. Und das, da haben wir auch Community-Projekte, die das schon implementiert haben in Go, in Java auch, äh, ich glaube auch in Rust, bin ich mir nicht sicher gerade. Ähm, aber das ist nur die API als Wrapper. Ähm, aber als SDK an sich fokussieren wir uns auf JavaScript. Und das kommt mit so vielen Advantages einfach, weil wir uns voll und ganz dann halt auch auf dieses javascript Ecosystem äh, konzentrieren können. Sehr, sehr cool. Danke für die detaillierte Antwort. Genau. Hier fragt noch jemand aus einer, ich glaube, Investorensicht. Und zwar, ich, ich denke, der ist auch sehr fasziniert vom Vortrag gewesen und fragt sich jetzt, ähm, wie es dann sein kann, dass ähm, Lisk jetzt von seinem äh, All-Time-High von 35 Dollar ähm, so jetzt wieder auf, äh, auf so einen relativ niedrigen Kurs für den Wert, den es eigentlich bietet, gefallen ist. Ja. Ähm, er sagt von 35 Dollar auf 1 Dollar. Ähm, ich glaube, äh, lass mich mal kurz gucken. Dann gerade sind wir irgendwie bei 3,20 oder so, noch vor kurzem bei 11. Ähm, Krypto ist halt super volat volatil ähm, und wir als Lisk Stiftung, was hinter dem Projekt steht, ähm, wir kümmern uns um die Technologie. Wir denken, Blockchain an sich ist extrem früh noch. Ähm, mittlerweile hat irgendwie jeder von Bitcoin und NFTs gehört, aber die wenigsten halten Krypto und ähm, ich habe jetzt einen, mir einen neuen Bankaccount gemacht bei Revolut. Ähm, die sind jetzt vielleicht nicht äh, oft ähm, das perfekte Beispiel, weil man die Krypto nicht runterziehen kann, aber es ist halt relativ weit verbreitet. Und dann habe ich mal gefragt, wer hat denn über Revolut schon Krypto gekauft? Die wenigsten. Ähm, und das zeigt mir einfach, Krypto ist noch in seinen, ähm, wie sagt man, Kinderschuhen. Ähm, und wir sind einfach deswegen komplett fokussiert auf Technology, auf ähm, Use Cases, damit Leute von dieser Technologie benefiten ähm, und nicht einfach nur spekulieren. Ähm, Lisk als Altcoin ist natürlich extrem volatil. Das war, das hat angefangen beim ICO, ähm, haben wir es rausgegeben bei 8 Cent. Ähm, dann kam es auf fast 40 Dollar und dann wieder runter, jetzt auf 3,20 Dollar. Ähm, aber da liegt halt einfach nicht unser Fokus. Wir dürfen auch relativ wenig Sachen machen mit der Stiftung im Bereich Finanzen. Ähm, wir zahlen Exchanges nie Listing Fees, ähm, wir betreiben aktuell kein Market Making, haben noch nie Market Making betrieben, ähm, wir fokussieren uns wirklich auf unsere Plattform und darauf, dass ähm, ja, es einen Nutzen bringt an die User, ähm, weil, wie gesagt, Blockchain ist noch ganz am Anfang und wir müssen mit unseren Funds auch noch die nächsten fünf oder zehn Jahre zurechtkommen, weil ich glaube, erst dann wird Blockchain richtig Mainstream. Deswegen von der Investorenperspektive, ich würde Lisk einfach als Langzeitinvestment sehen dann und so oder so in Krypto investiert man nicht einmalig eine große Summe und das war's. Wenn, dann investiert man jeden Monat eine kleinere Summe und das über die nächsten zehn Jahre, äh, wenn man daran glaubt, dass Blockchain als Industrie hochgeht und da bin ich schwer von überzeugt. Aber ja, ich habe natürlich keinen kein Eingriff in die Märkte, deswegen weiß ich auch nicht, wie das zu so erklären ist. Wir machen gute Arbeit seit Anfang an, wir sind eines der aktivsten Projekte auf der Development-Seite. Wir publishen jede Woche Blogposts, um Leute dazu zu informieren, was bei uns passiert. Wir bauen eine Community bei Discord auf. Wir haben jetzt dieses Lisk Center hier in Berlin. Wir haben eins in Utrecht. Das heißt, wir brechen auch in die reale Welt ein damit. Unser SDK nach drei Jahren, von 2016 bis 2019, existiert dann jetzt schon seit eineinhalb Jahren. Aber damit halt wirklich Applications gebaut werden, erfordert das noch die Interoperability. Ähm, die wird jetzt angekündigt und wird jetzt implementiert. Ich denke mal, nächstes Jahr sind wir mit einer Beta-Version dabei. Das heißt, wir haben kontinuierlichen Progress ähm, und mehr kann man, denke ich mal, nicht machen. Ja, vielen Dank. Ja, ich glaube auch, es ist einfach ein gutes Zeichen, dass man auch bei schlechten Kurs trotzdem weitermacht. Das Projekt gibt es ja jetzt schon sehr, sehr lange, seit fünf Jahren. Ich denke, das ist auch gerade jetzt als Investor, glaube ich, eher eine Stärke, würde ich so sehen, weil, keine Ahnung, wenn jetzt Lisk total overvalued wäre, dann hat man, kann man als Investor gar nichts holen, aber jetzt wäre, glaube ich, dann ein sehr guter Zeitpunkt. Genau, ich habe auch noch ein paar Fragen so aus so einer, ähm, also wir haben jetzt nicht nur Investoren in der Community, sondern auch Leute, die jetzt sagen, okay, ich bin selbstständig oder ich möchte mich selbstständig machen, vielleicht auch im Bereich Blockchain, weil ich da die Zukunft sehe. Ähm, wo würdest du sagen, können die jetzt am besten anfangen mit Lisk? Um. Also am besten Anfang, denke ich mal, tut man einfach dabei, Blockchain zu verstehen. Und zwar nicht nur oberflächlich, sondern wirklich tiefgründig. 
aller Anfang ist schwer. Ich würde einfach mal das Bitcoin White Paper runterladen, ausdrucken, lesen, ähm, online aktiv sein in den verschiedenen Kanälen und sich einfach mal so, auf Englisch sagt man, make your hands dirty. Einfach mal so anfangen, mal eine Wallet runterladen, egal welche, Bitcoin, Ethereum, List, ein ähm, paar Tokens kaufen, die hin und her schicken. Ähm, und so fängt man einfach mal generell an mit Blockchain. Ähm, wenn jetzt jemand schon ein bisschen weiter ist und sagt, okay, ich möchte mich selbstständig machen in der Blockchain-Industrie, dann kann ich aus meiner Perspektive natürlich nur Eigenwerbung machen und sagen, okay, hey, ähm, wenn du noch einen Partner hast, ähm, bewirb dich mit einem Pitch Deck, ähm, einem Business Plan und so ein bisschen Intro über die Leute, die dabei sind bei uns, beim Lisk Grant Program, bei dem du 66.000 Dollar kriegen kannst, um deine Blockchain Application zu entwickeln. Ähm, Milestone basiert, ähm, das heißt, du kriegst am Anfang direkt mal ein bisschen, kannst dein Projekt kickstarten damit und dann je Milestone kriegst du dann mehr Geld ausgeschüttet. Ähm, ich glaube, das ist ein relativ guter Einstieg als Unternehmer oder Entrepreneur in, in die Blockchain-Welt. Ist aber sehr schwierig, aber ich kann es nur empfehlen, bei mir war es sehr erfolgreich. Ja, klingt sehr, sehr gut und da kann man auch eigentlich auf das ähm, Center, das ihr jetzt in Berlin und Utrecht habt, zurückgreifen, nehme ich an. Ja, auf jeden Fall. Also sobald wir offen sind, einfach vorbeikommen, kannst du Fragen stellen dann, ähm, kannst bei den Meetups dann mitmachen, ähm, kannst hier arbeiten, kannst jeden Tag reinkommen und sonst alles hier weg uns trinken und einfach hier dann an deinem Projekt arbeiten. Und ich denke mal, jetzt am Anfang wird es relativ leer sein wegen der aktuellen Situation, aber mit der Zeit wird sich das dann auch hier füllen und eine kleine Community sich gründen, ähm, wo dann ein Neuling einfach mal reinkommen kann und gucken kann, was machen denn die anderen ähm, und vielleicht findet er so dann auch Co-Founders. Sehr, sehr cool. Mega. Ja, ich habe noch ein, zwei ähm, Fragen zu dem Vortrag gehabt und zwar ähm, mit den Sidechains, also du hast ja auch gesagt, dass Sidechains auch andere Sidechains haben können. Ähm, wie weit geht das? Also können wir jetzt eine Sidechain haben, die eine Sidechain hat, die eine Sidechain hat, die eine Sidechain hat oder ist es unbegrenzt? Ja. Oder? Ähm, also an sich, ähm, was ich meinte ist, dass dann die Main Chain eine Sidechain mhm. hat und du kannst dann neben der auch nochmal eine Sidechain kreieren, die aber auch zur Main Chain connected ist. Ähm, um halt dann den Traffic da zu beiden zu leiten. Aber natürlich kann auch eine Sidechain eine neue Sidechain haben. Das wird dann aber ein bisschen kompliziert, ähm, aber an sich geht das unendlich. Aber dann müsstest du ein paar Mechanismen von der Mainchain auch in die Sidechain implementieren. Ähm, es geht alles, alles offen, alles da, ähm, aber wir fokussieren uns erstmal nur darauf, Mainchain zu einer Sidechain und wenn jemand dann mehr braucht, dann wieder eine normale Sidechain von der Mainchain und nicht eine Sidechain von der Sidechain. Ähm, aber an sich hast du da keine Limits. Ich würde es nur nicht äh, übertreiben, weil wirklich Maximum gerade getestet war, 6,5 Millionen Transaktionen, das reicht. Also Uniswap hat wirklich den größten Use Case aktuell in der Blockchain-Szene, realen Use Case, kein, kein Fake und das sind ein paar hunderttausend Transaktionen am Tag ähm, und dann mit sechs Millionen bist du da sehr, sehr gut bedient, glaube ich. Sehr, sehr cool. Ja. Und ähm, fällt dir jetzt so spontan noch ein paar andere Use Cases ein, die vielleicht zu so den äh, Zuschauern jetzt mal sehr direkt zeigen, okay, wo könnte es in meinem Alltag was zu tun haben oder auch, wenn ich jetzt als Investor agiere, warum ist es im Alltag sehr, sehr relevant, dass ich daran investieren sollte? Um, Investment, wow. um, also man kann halt gucken, was sind Use Cases für Blockchain, die heutzutage schon benutzt werden. Um, und ich glaube, groß, großenteils ist das einfach der DeFi-Space. Um, das heißt, Tokens, die irgendwie nutzbar sind in einem Decentralized Exchange, auf einer Landing-Plattform, in einem algorithmischen Stablecoin, um, in einem NFT-Marketplace ich glaube, das ist so ein großer Use Case aktuell, der Nutzen findet. Ähm, und ja, die ganzen Projekte, die driven halt Value und Value sollte dann äh, irgendwann auch den Preisanstieg erzeugen, auch wenn es oft verspätet oder verzögert ist. Ähm, und ein anderer Use Case ist, denke ich mal, sehr prävalent ähm, Gaming, ähm, where, äh, da will ich in Englisch reden, wo dann ähm, NFTs hauptsächlich benutzt werden als Collectibles, die man breeden kann, ähm, aber auch die irgendwelche Trading Card Games repräsentieren ähm, und dadurch halt ja, einen bestimmten Value haben, weil sie halt rare sind, selten sind. Ähm, aber ja, Gaming ist ein anderer großer Use Case. Wir sehen aber halt bei beiden, dass die Nutzung relativ stark schwankt mit ähm, ja, dem Preis auch. 
Das heißt, wenn der Preis hochgeht, wird alles auf einmal mega oft benutzt. Wenn der Preis runtergeht, dann eher nicht mehr so. Und wenn man den Nutzen, also die Nutzungsanzahl mit anderen zentralen Apps vergleicht, ist überall alles noch relativ gering. Ähm, aber wenn, dann würde ich sagen, diese zwei Ecken oder äh, Richtungen für Blockchain-Applications werden heutzutage schon relativ stark genutzt im Vergleich zu anderen Sachen. Sehr, sehr cool. Also wenn ich jetzt sagen würde, ich würde ein neues Trading Game entwickeln, könnte ich denken, okay, das ist gut, wenn das online oder wenn es vor allem dezentral stattfindet, dann nutze ich jetzt Lisk für, weil ich da praktisch schon alle Tools für habe und ähm, genau. Genau, so. ja. Du könntest halt dann unser Lisk SDK benutzen, um deine Blockchain zu bauen, ähm, wo dann jede Karte ein NFT ist und dann hast du halt dein Game, du kannst einfach deine, dein Spiel einfach so abhalten, sowas wie Magic the Gathering oder sowas, aber dann bildet sich natürlich ein Sekundärmarkt für die Karten. Bei Magic the Gathering ist das passiert, bei Pokémon, bei Yu-Gi-Oh! überall. Und dann ähm, kannst du aber es ermöglichen, dass die Karten direkt auf der Blockchain auch versteigert werden können, verkauft werden können. Ähm, Baseballkarten zum Beispiel haben ja extrem hohen Wert, aber da muss, müssen die Leute zum Teil über die ganze Welt fliegen, um die Karte dann abzuholen. Mit Blockchain ist das natürlich anders. Ähm, aber natürlich ist das dann etwas rein Digitales. Ähm, wenn wir jetzt zum Beispiel in die Welt der Kunst gehen, ähm, da sehen wir dann oft auch, dass Künstler ein NFT kreieren, aber dann im Realen auch nochmal das äh, reale Gegenstück haben, wo dann, wo man so eine kleine Plakette dann irgendwie noch drauf hat mit einem QR-Code, welche dann so, zu diesem NFT linkt. Ähm, aber das sind alles ganz coole Use Cases ähm, und definitiv alles machbar auf unserer Plattform dann mit dem SDK. Mega cool. Und äh, wenn ich jetzt ähm, in LSK, äh, L LSK äh, in, in die ähm, Währung investiert habe, dann profitiere ich natürlich auch davon, wenn mal viel stattfindet auf den Sidechains, ähm, weil ich praktisch, also dann partizipiere ich mit davon, wenn das, wenn zum Beispiel dieses Trading Card Game nachgefragt wird, nehme ich an. Ja, also ähm, ich, ich mag es so ungern über Preis zu reden, aber mhm. jetzt sagen wir mal so, es gibt aktuell 140 Millionen LSK Tokens. Und die Hälfte ungefähr wird aktuell benutzt, um den Consensus Algorithm ähm, zu betreiben, also dieses Delegate Proof of Stake. Ähm, also vereinfacht gesagt, die Hälfte wird gestaked auf unserer Plattform. Das heißt, es sind so 70 Millionen Tokens über, die entweder nur auf Exchanges rumliegen oder in irgendwelchen Wallets. So, jetzt hast du aber ähm, später verschiedene Sidechains, ähm, sagen wir mal ein DEX, der wie Uniswap ein Automated Market Maker ist, wo man Tokens locken muss, um halt die fürs Market Banking zur Verfügung zu stellen und ähm, dann earnt man oder man kriegt dann einen kleinen Teil der Fees, die dabei zustande kommen. Und wenn jetzt Lisk irgendeine Sidechain hat, die ein DEX ist, der so implementiert auf diese Art ist, ähm, verschwinden halt auch nochmal eine ganze Menge LSK Tokens in diese Sidechain rein. Und dann hast du ein anderes, was zum Beispiel ein NFT Game ist, ähm, wo dann auch nochmal ein paar LSK Tokens drin sind, damit die User einfach, sagen wir mal, sich irgendwelche NFTs, ähm, ähm, wie sagt man, ähm, kaufen können, äh, ersteigern können. Und ähm, dann hast du 100 Sidechains, wo überall ein paar Listen drin liegen. Ähm, und das irgendwann resultiert natürlich in etwas, das nennt man aktuell Liquidity Crisis, äh, Liquiditätskrise, äh, dass du halt einfach auf den Exchanges dann nicht mehr genug LSK Tokens hast weil die alle in den Sidechains für die Utility benutzt werden, für die Use Cases benutzt werden, äh, gelockt sind. Ähm, das ist dieser famous Begriff äh, Total Value Locked, TVL. Ähm, der ist halt relativ hoch äh, in den Sidechains, aber dann auch nochmal auf der Main Chain mit dem Consensus Algorithmus. Ähm, und mit unserem Update jetzt auf Mainnet Version 3 ähm, werden auch die Tokens wirklich gelockt bei einem Staking. Vorher war das nicht der Fall. Ähm, jetzt wird das gelockt für die Validatoren auf dem Netzwerk einen Monat lang und für alle, die dann für diese Validatoren wählen, ein paar Stunden lang. Ähm, das heißt, irgendwann kommt es zu dieser Liquidity-Crisis und das heißt, es gibt einfach nicht mehr genug LSK-Tokens auf den Exchanges für Leute, die die kaufen wollen. Und das ist dann jedenfalls aktuell immer so der Fall, dass der Preis dann richtig hoch schießt, weil dann die Leute einfach mehr gewillt sind zu zahlen, weil es halt einfach nicht mehr so viele LSK-Tokens gibt. Das ist so eine Theorie, die passieren kann. Ähm, und ja, auf die viele Leute, denke ich mal, in unserer Community als Investoren auch bauen werden. Danke für die Antwort. Ähm, 
Genau, da fragt M4 Lock, fragt, äh, ob du schon Grandmaster in Magic bist. Ähm, leider nein. <lacht> ich arbeite zu viel, keine Zeit zum Zocken mehr. <lacht> ja, sehr, sehr cool. <lacht> ja, bei mir war es dann auch Yu-Gi-Oh! als Trading Card Game, nicht Magic. Aber ja. ja, bei mir auch cool. damals. Yu-Gi-Oh! Immer viel getradet und gezockt. Und davor Pokémon, aber das nur getradet, das hat ja keiner gespielt, glaube ich. Ja. <lacht> aber lang, lang ist es sehr. Ja, bei mir auch. Boah, ähm, genau, ich habe, ich hab, glaube ich, noch mir eine inhaltliche Frage aufgeschrieben, und zwar, ähm, wenn, ähm, wenn jemand, wenn der Sidechain stirbt und äh, das recovered wird, dann reicht eine Person aus, die sagt, hey, ich benutze auch diese Sidechain und ich recover die und dann bekommen alle das recovered? Genau. Cool. Ja, also, ähm, ja, ähm, ich weiß nicht genau, ob das jetzt eine Person kann. Ich glaube, die eine Person muss sagen, wer recovered wird. Das heißt, eine andere Person kann auch deine Tokens recovern. Aber es das heißt nicht, dass wenn jetzt eine Person diesen Recovery Mechanism Transaction schickt, dass alle automatisch recovered werden, sondern dass es eher so ein ähm, spezifischer Prozess ist. Aber eine Person kann das dann auch einfach freiwillig für alle anderen machen, zum Beispiel jetzt wir als Stiftung können sagen, okay, hey, hier war jetzt diese App, die ist jetzt terminated worden und ein paar User in der Community beschweren sich, die haben ihre Tokens nicht bekommen, dann können wir auch diese Transaktion schicken und die Tokens dann für diese Leute recovern, weil alle Informationen, die dafür notwendig sind, sind public, die hat jeder. Okay, sehr, sehr public cool. hier. Ja. Ja. Klasse. Genau. Ähm, ja, perfekt. Vielen, vielen Dank. Falls jetzt äh, keine weiteren Fragen mehr reinkommen, ähm, genau, ihr habt jetzt noch kurz die Chance zu fragen, sonst gebe ich euch auch nochmal die Information, ähm, ihr, wenn ihr euch bei Cryptopia.cash registriert, bekommt ihr jetzt alle weiteren äh, Events mit und das nächste Event findet um 12 statt mit Markus Gabor, genau und ja, Max, vielen, vielen Dank, dass du auch so viel Zeit genommen hast, fand ich mega, mega faszinierend und äh, ich bin sehr, sehr hyped auf den Space in Berlin auf jeden Fall. Ja, ich hoffe, dich bald dann mal in Berlin begrüßen zu können. Und äh, ja, checkt einfach mal unsere Webseite aus. Wie gesagt, alles ist höchst technisch, aber ich hoffe, ich konnte euch so ein bisschen einen Einblick in die Materie schildern. Ähm, sorry, dass es auf Englisch ist, aber das äh, ist für mich much more scalable, äh, damit ich es später, später auch auf ähm, YouTube und so verbreiten kann. Ähm, wenn ihr noch Fragen habt, joint us bei lisk.chat. Das ist unser Discord-Server. Da könnt ihr dann nochmal unserer Community oder mir oder meinem Team alle Fragen stellen, die ihr auf eurem ähm, Mind habt. Und ja, bitte folgt mir auch auf Twitter und YouTube, ähm, weil dort werde ich oder dort poste ich immer relativ viele Updates zum Projekt. Dann bleibt ihr auch up to date. Klasse. Vielen, vielen Dank. Dann äh, beende ich an der Stelle den Stream. Danke auch fürs Zusehen. Ich finde es sehr, sehr cool, dass viele so lange dabei gewesen sind und auch äh, M4 Log sagt auch, danke für den Vortrag. Gut, macht's gut. Wir sehen uns um 12 Vielen Dank, Max. Ja, danke. Ciao.